Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 1. Today, we'll tie together everything we learned about gases in the last video, and get one of the most useful equations in all of chemistry. It'll allow us to do a lot more with gases, and even enable us to identify an unknown gas when we encounter one for the first time. In the last video, we saw three different equations that connect different properties of gases. First, there was Boyle's Law, which tells us how the pressure and volume of a gas are connected. Next was Charles's Law, which ties together a gas's volume and temperature. And finally was Avogadro's Law, which tells us that a gas's volume is proportional to the number of moles. In 1834, the French physicist Emile Clapeyron noticed that all three of these relationships involve volume, so he combined them all into one equation. Here's how. First, notice that the volume is proportional to the number of moles. Next, Charles's law tells us that the volume is also proportional to the temperature. So the volume is proportional to n times t. Boyle's law tells us that the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. So v will be proportional to n times t divided by p, the pressure. Finally, notice that the volume is proportional to nt over p, not equal to it. If we want the exact value of the volume, we get it by multiplying the number on the right by a constant. We'll use the letter r for that constant. Now this is one way of writing what's known as the ideal gas law. We usually write it slightly differently, though. We multiply both sides by p to get rid of the fraction, and we put the r in the middle of the right side so that we get pv equals nrt. As we'll see in a minute, this ideal gas law is one of the most useful equations about gases we have. First, though, I want to tell you about that number r. That's called the gas law constant, and it always has the same value. Just like Avogadro's number, or the speed of light, it's a number you should try to memorize as soon as you can, because we'll use it often in the rest of this course, and in general chemistry, too. R is equal to 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres, divided by kelvins times moles. That's a complicated unit, but it's really helpful to remember it because it tells you what the units need to be for everything else in the equation. So, the pressure needs to be in atmospheres. If you use millimeters of mercury, the units won't work out, and your answer will be an incorrect number. In the same way, the volume needs to be in liters, and the temperature needs to be Kelvin. Any other units will give you an incorrect result. So what can we do with this? Let's try an example. Suppose we have 500 millimeter can of spray deodorant containing 0 0.100 moles of gas at 25.0 degrees Celsius. What's the pressure inside the can? We'll use the ideal gas law to figure out the answer. We're trying to determine the pressure, P, so we'll just plug the other data into the equation. The volume is 500 milliliters. But remember, we need the units for volume to be liters, so we'll convert this to 0 0.500 liters. Next, we'll use 0 0.100 moles for n. R is the ideal gas law constant, 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over kelvins times moles. And T is the temperature, which needs to be in kelvins. So that's 298.15 kelvin. If you've forgotten how to convert Celsius to kelvin, you should check video number 35, where we talked more about that. When we perform this calculation, we find that the pressure in the can is 4.89 atmospheres, almost five times atmospheric pressure, so that's what's in your can of spray deodorant. Let's try another example. Take a deep breath. Suppose your lungs hold about 5.00 liters of air. That's the average for the lungs of a healthy adult. How many moles of air are there in your lungs? We'll use the ideal gas law to figure this out. We're looking for n, and we'll plug the other data into the equation. p is the pressure. If you're at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 1.00 atmospheres, so that'll also be the pressure in your lungs. v is 5.00 liters, 
and R is 0 0.8206 liters atmospheres per Kelvin mole. What about the temperature? Well, if you hold the air in your lungs for a little while, it'll be at your body temperature, which is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37.0 Celsius. We'll convert that into Kelvin, which is 310.15 Kelvin. When we solve the equation, we find that N is equal to 0 0.196 moles of air. So, the ideal gas law allows us to find the pressure, volume, temperature, or moles of any gas if we know the other three. But there's more that we can do with this equation, and this is what makes it especially useful. Suppose we have 500 mils of an unknown gas, and it weighs 0 0.408 grams. The temperature in the room is 25 degrees Celsius, and the pressure is 752 millimeters of mercury. With that information, we can figure out what the gas actually is. Here's how we do that. If you look at the ideal gas law, you'll see that we know P, V, and T. So we can use the equation to solve for N, the number of moles. Let's do that. We'll convert P to atmospheres, V to liters, and T to Kelvin. If you don't know how to do those conversions, you'll want to check video 35 to get caught up. So, we have a pressure of 0 0.989 atmospheres, a volume of 0 0.500 liters, and a temperature of 298.15 Kelvin. Solving the equation for N gives us 0 0.0202 moles. This makes it possible for us to figure out the molecular weight of the unknown gas. The molecular weight is measured in grams per mole. So, since we know the mass of our gas, and we know the number of moles, we can determine the molecular weight. It turns out that the molecular weight is 20.2 grams per mole. This information gives us a very good idea of the identity of the unknown gas. There aren't too many gases that have the exact same weight, so we can just look at a list of molecular weights of gases and that'll narrow it down for us. It turns out that one of the only gases that weighs 20.2 grams per mole is neon, so that's probably what our unknown is. Well, that's all for now. Notice that the equation we've been using lately is called the ideal gas law. So we're looking at ideal situations, not realistic ones. In the next video, we'll look at more realistic examples of gases, and we'll see that it gives us an even more useful way to think about gases and how they behave. That'll be our last lesson we have in this course, and it'll be a great topic to end on. I hope you'll join me for that. So, until next time, have a good week.